Very true. Um, okay. Now, um, let's let's uh, begin the interview. Okay. Yeah. Um, a, a new documentary is uh, releasing this week in cinemas, a film called Facing Monsters. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to the director of Facing Monsters, Bentley Dean. Bentley, welcome to Movie Metropolis. I'm feeling very welcome, actually, albeit through, um, you know, uh, the auspices of uh, Zoom. <laughs> and Bentley, I, I remember the last time we spoke was about your film, Tanner. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, um, I th my memory was it was actually straight after a screening and down a corridor or something like that, was it? Yep. You have a very good memory, <laughs> yes, at the Rover Centre on the side. <laughs> That's right. Well, this time sitting, we on, sitting on the floor outside the toilets, maybe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, most salubrious uh, section of the movie. <laughs> well, Bentley, it's great to talk to you again. And it, it's this is such an intriguing documentary about uh, Kirby Brown, his family, etc., and him being a slab wave surfer, which I hadn't heard that term before in mm. Western Australia. How did you first uh, come across him? Well, actually, it's um, an unusual one for me because uh, this was one where I was I was called in at the very last minute. In fact, the, the the film, a film about Kirby, had been you know kicking around for a number of years, particularly between he and and his good mate and the cinematographer in the in the film, uh, Rick uh, Rafici, and um, it had you know gone as as documentaries do had many permutations until um, uh, Jeffrey Smith, who did the English. Uh, surgeon, great documentarian, um, had come on board as the director, but he'd actually been shooting it for two weeks, uh, but had to pull out for personal reasons. And so I just got a call out of the blue saying, "Hey, you know, do you want to do you want to do this?" I actually did know Jeffrey, and and he gave me the lowdown about like who Kirby was and what they were up to and what they were hoping to achieve. And I just thought this just sounds incredible. Like he's just you see the footage of him. He is he is like a He's a poet, uh, like a, a, a dancer, he's a, and an athlete and a madman, like uh, on these waves. And uh, the geography in which, you know, he he haunts uh, is extraordinary too. And so it was a real opportunity for me to, you know, go, go to some places I'd never been to before and be taken there by people who know them really well. Um, and also work in a way which I've never worked before, which is like to have a camera person, you know, I normally do my own shooting, like, in, you know, I'd have a camera person and I'd have multiple, like I'd have like an aerial operator and uh, on, 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 on um, watercraft and, and all of these things. So I leapt at the opportunity. Wow, what an incredible mm. story. And uh, mm. how much of the uh, original footage uh, that uh, uh, Jeffrey, I think you said, uh, had been involved with, uh, did you use in the final version of the film? Not much in the end, but it's it was uh, except for that there was a crucial scene at the very beginning, which is sort of like a, a behind the scenes depiction of um, almost like a retelling of his the, the the very first wave, the very first slab wave that sets him off on this is the most recent trajectory of his life, um, and so he'd recorded that really crucial moment. So these these breaks don't happen very often. You know, sometimes they don't happen in, for the entire year. And so uh, they had, Jeffrey had, had directed that particular scene. I mean, thankfully, because it didn't happen again, you know, whilst we were, we were filming. But so it was like small, but crucial. Okay. <laughs> but nevertheless, <laughs> once you, you took over, you, you've really come up with some astounding footage, uh, as well as the, uh, the interviews uh, with Kirby and family and friends and so on. It's, um, uh, did they give you permission to... Uh, uh, ask anything, talk about anything, or were there some no-go areas? Yeah, look, um, th that was actually, you know, made really clear that, that that's, it wasn't immediately up front that they said that they wanted to go into the really dark territories like, you know, um, uh, uh, I guess, you know, Kirby's addiction and depression and, um, but at a certain point, I guess there was a level of trust that um uh had been developed and was you know taking us aside just quietly said look look we really think it's important as a reflection of who kirby is in relation to his family as well um to to depict this in, in the film so look the only things the only things that were off limits was to name the locations which is a uh very understandable 
Um, but uh, we, we, we actually did name the locations, but we, we, we gave them their, their, the, the names that they've had for tens of thousands of years by the uh, Indigenous peoples of, of Australia. So uh -huh. do your research. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. But, but, but this part of Western Australia, uh, which I'm not particularly familiar with, a, a beautiful uh, part of, uh, of southern Western Australia. And, and I suppose there were some challenges too, apart from drone photography, and, but also photographing it and, and getting the right shots. Uh, which always is the uh, is the hurdle, isn't it? Yeah, like you're dealing with not only nature, mother nature. You're dealing with, you know, it's almost completely unpredictable. You know, from one even just from one wave to the next, let alone knowing whether or not you know there will be uh, a surfable break. You know, a thousand kilometres away, but you've got to turn up to look at it anyway. You know, and then you're there. You know, okay, well, you know have we got the skills and the wherewithal to, to capture the moment the subjective experience that you know you want you know in a you know in a in in cinema um but it's not make-believe you know it's not no you know we're, we're gonna do a cgi wave here it's real it's very real and it's very dangerous as well and so uh luckily you know we had some exceptional uh skill out there and in particular rick rafici who you know is arguably the world's best you know surf uh cinematographer um and a real find for me was uh jeremy ashton who was meant to be just our sound recordist but turned out to be an extraordinary drone pilot and you know he's responsible for some of those iconic images like the pink lake and that that amazing wave uh or waves that he catches from an aerial perspective um so that um even even kirby's brother uh has some cracker shots like he's he holds like a gopro on the end of a stick at some crucial moments and he's he's like the an, an on the water cinematographer as well so and there was there's also just technology really assisted us like some real advances in technology these 360 gopros that we had mounted like front and back of jet skis and and we, you, they're, they're amazing i've never used those before but essentially they do record 360 degrees and then in the edit suite, you can actually choose where you want the frame and you can pan and tilt and even zoom in and out. And um, they, they, they gave us, I guess, I think, you know, I'm not sure how you feel, but uh, a lot of people have said like the, the, the closest experience you can get to, to, to being on those waves. So. Very immersive. I absolutely mm. agree. Yes, some mm -hmm. of those, uh, those shots are quite incredible. Um, I mean, and I know that there are a number of other surfing movies, etc. Uh, but this is quite different from that mm. uh, sort of uh, surfing movie because this is about an individual, about his obsession, um, mm. and that, in fact, he he doesn't want to continue if he can't surf, and and mm. when uh, and, and do that slab uh, way of surfing, and it's so startling to see his injury. It, it, mm. That was amazing the way he shot that. Hmm. Yeah, look, it was it was really it was always on the cards. Like you know, he would say, Rick would say, uh, look, it's not a matter of if, but when. You know, the, the, an injury like that was going to happen, um, no matter how good you are. Like you know, at the end of the day, you know, nature's going to have her way, and that 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 sort of thing was it's kind of kind of challenging as a filmmaker because like you know on the one hand you know uh are you question yourself like are you, were you are you inviting disaster by turning a camera on him and um you know uh um, possibly make him do you know or invite him to do things that you know he wouldn't ordinarily would do so we had very frank discussions right up front about about those very issues and look his his point of view was that um he's been surfing these kind of waves without a camera being there he fully intends to keep on doing that you know without a camera there as well um and that it was important to capture no matter what happened um uh, because that is part of who he is and what they do in fact um there there were there, i remember on the day of the the incident that um there was some some rumor had got out that it was you know it was so traumatic the 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 experience that 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 the that we were not going to use that 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 footage and um which is not true it was never going to be the case but there was a rumor out and it and it, and it got back to 
he and his brother and, and, and they were like, you have to use it. It's about who we are. This is what it's all about. And um, so uh, as a consequence, it is it is very much in there. And I think it does really encapsulate, um, I guess, uh, what's at stake and, and how important um, these waves are to him. Mm, clearly. Mm. So over what time period um, did you shoot this film? Well, there was, we, this part of the, the shoot was from um, over like the, I guess the winter period of a year because that's when surfs up like all these big swells like come over in the winter from from africa really and um uh uh but there is a lot of archival uh in the in the film um like that goes back to when he was like a, a kid you know uh, being born um, and including some some extraordinary <laughs> surfing like as a very young person like you know he, he's a he was like a world-class um competitive surfer and um, like he was doing the tour with like, you know, some really well-known names and, um, but uh, he, he decided, no, that's not for me. You know, the waves aren't big enough <laughs> and not challenging enough. And, and also more than that, I think, wanted to actually get out into where the nature is most raw. And um, he loves the isolation and the challenge of all of that. So in answer to your question, I think, you know, it's, it's about 30 odd years in the making, this film, but um, most of it was in that, that, that winter um, period of last year, or the year before, actually. Okay. Mm. And, and tell me, I'm always intrigued by this. Um, when Kirby saw the final edit, how did he respond? Look, he was actually quite involved in the edit. So he was, he, he was, he was, he really wanted to make sure, his big thing, he wanted to make sure that we got the waves right. You know, because um, I'm not a surfer, um, and uh, he wanted to, you know, he he would actually put, start pointing out things and say, no, no, why this is important? Because there'd be sometimes you go like, oh, that wave has got to be in there because like it just is impressive and massive, and he goes like, nah, you know, it's it's actually not, you know, it's not not that impressive, um, you know, just the way in which it forms, how I'm, how I'm positioned on it etc so to the lay person it's not right so uh, i was you know it was a bloody great position to be in like to have someone you know perhaps the world's expert like uh, to, to talk you through why uh certain waves are important um so he was actually quite involved in the edit <clears throat> to a, like a, a really you know detailed way and just to make sure that we get the the, the the waves right so there weren't really any surprises uh for him i think he was he was a bit worried about how it might go down with his family but particularly his, his father and and his um partner and friends and and um uh, i think he was a bit nervous about all of that but um you know uh, unfortunately due to COVID, i couldn't be there for its world premiere over you know in one of one of their hometowns over in wa uh but it went went down extremely well like one of those sort of like howling at the screen uh kind of experiences that you hope for in a movie <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Great to hear that. <laughs> In terms of the editing, though, just going back to that, um, obviously, as you said, he was involved, but you had lots and lots of footage as well. And um, making those decisions and deciding between yourself about what should stay in the final version, that mm. uh, must be quite a process. It was quite a process for this one because, because I came so late into it, there was actually quite a quite a fixed idea. I mean, there have been a number of ideas over the years, but there was, all, and in this version, it was quite a fixed idea about what it might look like. And and when you come in late into a, a project, you, you, you kind of have to think on your feet, you know, a lot more. And there were certain, uh, what, what became apparent, what was really important about the film actually did come quite late, like in the process of making the film and even into the edit about what this film actually was. Um, it, it wasn't, going to be so much about the relationship between he and his brother you know that wasn't the intention and, and but it becomes clear that okay my god that's what this is about you know it is that is the key relationship you know in this film and um so the edit was quite important for that reason um the other thing um that became like apparent throughout the making and you know just thinking thinking on my feet was that really it's it, it's almost like a coming of age or coming of ages 
you know, uh, story for him. It's like his evolution from a boy to a, a young adult to a young man to a to a man, you know, with responsibilities. And each of those parts of that story can be told in discrete locations that happen to be sort of like, you know, the first time anyone surfed a particular break and the consequences, you know, from that. And so that's how we ultimately structured the film. And it just so happened that that, that was, it was actually quite organic. You know, it wasn't a forced thing. It, it literally happened that, you know, these important moments in his life were embedded in the landscape. And, um, but that, it, takes a, it takes a while to sort of discover that sometimes. No, I understand. It's a, mm. um, documentary filmmaking is always a process and you're, mm. you're finding the story uh, the, or the kernel of the story is always uh, an interesting part of it. Mm. Tell me about the use of music, which I found quite interesting and, and your choices there. Yeah, quite eclectic, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a little bit of, kind of a little bit of everything. Look, um, I guess, uh, you know, I'm a big believer in um, uh, not, not, not having any rules about anything, really, um, uh, uh, apart from ethical filmmaking. Um, but uh, look, uh, in, in, including with music, like it's, it's uh, my, my rule is like whatever works, you know, if it's working, we don't know why, but it's working, let's do it. Um, and so like in the soundtrack is like some, you know, beautifully composed music. Um, uh, uh, there's um, uh, some like you know, great heavy metal uh, music that were you know really important to Kirby. He listens to that a lot. Uh, Radiohead um, uh, provided some music, you know, for like this the, the, what, the, the climax of the film where where he's basically in heaven. He finds like the the break that he's always been looking for his entire life, and it just works works perfectly. Um, uh, there's uh, almost like a uh, a sound but it's it is it is it is music but it's a voice it's like a a, a choral voice that the, the sound of the ocean but it's like almost like a siren you know calling him to both his uh pleasure and his um possible doom um <laughs> but uh yeah it was a, a real mix i mean i'm interested in your opinion like uh what, what were your what were your thoughts I, I like, I mean, I always enjoy music in documentaries to begin with, especially mm. the way music is used. But here, that eclectic nature, as you say, um, really sharpens and heightens his own character to some extent mm. as well, who he is, and mm. uh, using appropriate music to uh, counterpoint that. So, no, I, I thought mm. it was very, very clever use of music. So, <laughs> oh, well. oh, good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> so, Facing Monsters is releasing in, uh, I know it's already played in WA. Uh, releasing in Australia or in uh, various cinemas from Thursday. I can imagine, uh, apart from that, that it would have some international currency as well. Yeah, look, um, I'm, I'm just the mere director on this, so um, I'm not really in charge of uh, the distribution. But yeah, my understanding is there's, there's, there's plans to go big internationally as well. And I mean, it's pretty universal. And I think that there's just some places that, you know, you'll see some, as you know, from some of the images in there, there's just, you've never seen that on the big screen before. So like, you, you did think that it would do well. Yeah. Well, I can see the American surfing community it would be uh, highly interested in this film. <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. Like, but it was, that was actually probably the most important brief that I got, that it, it wasn't just going to be another surf movie. You know that it, it had to transcend that you know, in some way. Um, and uh, look, really went serious about it. I think possibly that was one of the reasons I got the call in the first place is because I'm not a surfer <laughs> but um, uh, but like uh, you know I do understand uh, I guess um, or, or, or or I am fascinated you know by people with a um, very strong uh, ways of being in the world yeah fair enough too and and mm -hmm. I mean the films that you've made are quite uh, eclectic in itself in terms of what you've been involved with and so on so what's next for you Bentley yeah that's a, a actually always a good question and a daunting one um, look I make actually there is another film coming out uh, 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 this uh, month it's going to be again completely different um, uh, it's about uh, going into the um, neo-nazis of uh, Australia that all uh, 
but um, you'll probably hear more about that later. I'm not even sure if I mean meant to mention it just yet, but um, there you go. I have, uh, but that's a feature film um, that, that'll be coming out this month. Um, uh, might even do another interview with you soon, but um, <laughs> uh, that, 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 yeah, <laughs> uh, couldn't get you know further from this one in subject matter if you tried. But uh, um, and then like I've, I do, I do have like a number of other other projects that are sort of in development, but I don't want to jinx them. I perfectly understand that. And I still look forward to, to this film about neo-Nazis in Australia. Wow, that's uh, amazing. Um, we've been speaking to Bentley Dean, who's the director of Facing Monsters, releasing in uh, cinemas from Thursday, March the 10th. Bentley, as always, great to talk to you. Yeah, great to talk to you too, Peter. Bye-bye. See ya.